We are live on a lovely Friday, and we welcome you to our high noon broadcast. This is Prayer Nation, and we are so thankful to have you with us today. We have a provocative title, and I'm probably going to make some people angry today, but um, at the same time, I'm hoping that we can bring a balance to this season and uh, have deeper grasp of what we are actually up against in the spirit world in the midst of times of lots of festivities. Obviously, we do the best we can uh, to navigate in this world, and with our lack of real history, our lack of uh, real depth of memory, we are so five minutes ago uh, with everything that we do and everything uh, that we kind of process in culture, uh, the one thing that we learn from history is that we do not learn from history. So we welcome you today, Church Triumphant family. We welcome you, those of you that are under our covering, a part of our greater extended network across the United States and some even uh, in other countries. We're so very thankful for all of our partners, all of the great men and women of God that are leading organizations, uh, district superintendents, bishops, apostles, missionaries, prophets, evangelists, pastors. We're so thankful for all of you, those of you that teach, those of you that are intercessors, those of you that are in the early stages of the prophetic, those of you that have been in it for a while. I could just keep going on and on. We have a full range of people, and I'm so thankful that we have a lot of diversity that connects with us because Jesus created all of this diversity, and if it's going to be around the throne, then it should be manifested in the church today, and especially when we have something called Prayer Nation, where we are pulling people from all around the world to pray together. It shouldn't just uh, be English. It shouldn't just be one ethnicity. It really should be everything uh, being manifest because this is a house of prayer for all nations, and so we are so thankful for that. I have been doing a lot of uh, ancient uh, uh, manuscript studies this week. Been working a lot with uh, with a, a rabbi uh, via uh, some of my online research and books, etc. Uh, that that I have been just given recently, and uh, I had seen some of his materials before, and I'm going back to them again because of uh, one of my partners sending it to me, and I'm very thankful for that. Appreciate um, Sir Gary. Thank you for sending it. Um, but we, we, uh, we are looking at some of these manuscripts and they're finding Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament. And most, most of the time we, we think that they were all written in Greek, but we're finding more and more of the manuscripts, even in the Vatican, uh, they're finding these manuscripts. Um, there was a 14th century, uh, Spanish rabbi who had as a part of his appendix of one of his books, a full uh, uh, Hebrew Matthew. Uh, so in other words, the Gospel of Matthew written uh, in Hebrew. They thought it was a copy. Come to find out, it was an original or, or it was a reflective of an original. It had not been translated from uh, Greek into Hebrew, but it was translated from Hebrew to Hebrew. Uh, and there was markings from the scribes, etc., proving that point. And so they have found now 28 others of these documents. It's really fascinating. But what it does, you know, when you start reading these things, it does a couple of things. First, it makes you realize how much you don't know. Uh, secondly, it, it creates humility. Uh, third, it creates hunger to know more and uh, desire to learn the ancient languages and be more comfortable with them. But, but finally, I think what it does is it makes us always reevaluate, is that sometimes especially in American culture. I know we're not just talking to Americans today, but especially in Western civilization, Greek-based, logical reason, we have a lot of arrogance. This is the, uh, the knowledge shall increase part of Daniel's prophecy. Yes, there's knowledge like we've never had access to knowledge before, but the Bible says knowledge puffs up, and it's very easy for us, and myself included, to think, well, man, we really know something. Well, we're really informed. And, uh, and then we take for granted everything else that we do, and we just think that uh, it was well thought out of, or uh, there must be good reasons for it. And so we just kind of go with it, 
and just build on everything else. I remember as God began to open my understanding about a lot of things uh, that I went into a lot of spiritual warfare. The devil fights us over knowledge. The God of this world hath blinded their eyes. You have to understand the God of this world is doing its best to keep people from the truth, to block the truth. And so he's also going to send people into the church. So you see this with the Pharisees. You have taken away the key of knowledge and you stand at the door, Jesus said, and you won't go in yourself. So they, they, they see the door. They know it's there. They don't like what it represents. They don't like what the truth really is. They're going to try to wait, find a way around it. Uh, and so they, they hold back the truth. And so that's why Jesus was so vehement in his uh, judgment of them and, and, and bringing them down and speaking the truth to them and, and, uh, and, and really telling his disciples not to follow them or to do what they, what they do, but rather to listen rather to what the law said, to what Moses said, don't listen to these, uh, to these Pharisees. Of course, they hated him for it, and it was part of their uh, crucifixion uh, motive and agenda was to get rid of Jesus. The conspiracy was by religious folks who stirred up the political st structure of Rome uh, to do it and forced the hand of Pilate. Pilate was not wanting to uh, crucify Jesus. They stirred it up. And so religious people literally standing in the way of the very thing that they are apparently uh, standing for. And so we have to realize that from the foundation of the world, religion and revelation have been side by side, but they are not the same. You have Cain and Abel. One is operating in revelation. One is operating in religion. Cain says, I'll just bring whatever I want to bring, and God, you'll bless it. You'll bless my version of what you asked for. That's religion. Expecting God to sanction my way while I worship you. God says, no, I don't accept that sacrifice. I accept Abel's sacrifice. He's worshiping in spirit and in truth. He is operating in revelation. He is giving what I'm asking him to give. And so I'm going to acknowledge that. And so what does he do? He doesn't apologize, repent because his sacrifice is not accepted. He says, no, he doubles down. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to make my way right. And I'm going to kill Abel so that he can't tell me I'm wrong. Because religion has to be right. Man-made religion requires there to be no variance in the, in, the, in the whole dogma. Because if there's any variance, if any part is wrong, it's a house of cards. It all falls in upon itself. Revelation is totally different. You have heard it's been said, but I say to you. You have heard it's been said, but I say to you. Jesus is saying, I know how you've been taught. I know what the law said, but I'm here to add the next thing. I'm here to bring the revelation now of what it's all about. I'm here to fulfill the law and the prophets. What does that mean? I'm going to explain it. I'm going to bring it to pass. I'm going to help you to, to really grasp it. That which has been concealed is now being revealed. Moses had a face that was covered. Jesus had a face that was uncovered. Moses's glory faded. Jesus's glory continues to get more and more. And so when you walk with God, God is going to unveil the face. When you walk with God, there's more and more light. And so you should have experience in your walk with God where you say, you know what? I always thought it was like this, but now I know it's like this. You know what? I always believe like this, but then God just showed this to me. And I understand now, wow, I was really wrong about that. That is the humility of someone that's walking with God and hearing God and listening to God. And so tradition is one side of the Antichrist spirit, and you have Jezebel on the other side of that, of that, of that uh, Antichrist spirit. The two faces, one is the opposing of the prophet, the other is the opposing of the law. So the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, are represented on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And then you see in the valley, there is a manifestation of the boy who is called this generation. He's called this kind. And he throws him into the fire, throws him into the water. So these are counterfeits of the real. 
Uh, the fire of God is manifested uh, through Elijah. The water is manifested through uh, Moses. Water's coming out of a rock. Fire's coming down from heaven. Christ is that rock, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So we have all of these types and shadows that are all, all there on the Mount of Transfiguration. They find their fulfillment. That's why they're there to represent the law and the prophets. This is my beloved son. Hear him. He is the fulfillment of Moses and Elijah. The veil is taken away. You can see him in all of his glory. In the valley, there is the manifestation of the opposing force. Is that Satan always comes with a counterfeit of the real, and he cannot oppose the real until the next revelation of God is made known. So what you fight in the spirit world is based on current revelation. The problem with the disciples that were in the valley is that they were operating on old revelation. So they couldn't cast the devils out that were manifesting as a result of new revelation. The spirit world in the valley was responding to the face of Jesus shining in the mountain. They did not see it. Only Peter, James, and John saw it. And so Peter, James, and John were not discouraged. Matter of fact, Peter's still writing about it in his old age. They're still talking about that glory. Paul was writing about the glory of that mountain. It became something that continued to add more weight and value to the church as it progressed. But those that were immediately in the vicinity, the spirit world reacted and they saw this demon-possessed person. They'd been able to cast out demons before, but they couldn't cast this one out. They're dealing with new devils because we're on new levels. But if revelation for the whole is on a new level, but you're still behind, you're going to get beat up and you're going to be discouraged and frustrated. This is why we have to have current revelation, stay in step with the spirit all the time. So at this time of year, uh, we have a lot of tradition. We mix in a lot of really good things. I'm saying that now so you don't immediately just turn me off right now. You can if you want to. It's your choice. But we have to also call it for what it is. We have to know tradition for where tradition is. We have to acknowledge that. I can never get over it and deal with everything else that's around it if I'm not at least honest with what is going on in front of me and what I'm seeing around me. So uh, I gave a little bit of a provocative title today. It's the most wonderful time of the year. I'm in a wrong key. It's the most wonderful time. So everyone's dancing and twirling and singing uh, Christmas songs, but it's really the most pagan time of the year. There are, there are the, it's the end of Hanukkah. There's no more Hanukkah. There is no more uh, calendar uh, uh, that's, that's on God's calendar. There's no, there's no more feast days. There's nothing else. We don't have anything until Purim. Uh, this time of year, uh, there was nothing else on their calendar. It's, it, the rain is coming. It's, the sheep are in the folds. Uh, there, there, there's not a lot of things happening at this time of year. A lot of people do tours in Israel in December because uh, everything is open. There's no holidays shutting things down uh, on either the Muslim side or the Jewish side. It's a great time to do tours. When I uh, was in seminary, uh, uh, we were talking about this. They, they loved, and uh, these are apostolic Jewish people, um, they love to go to Israel in December. Uh, everything is open. There's, there's nothing to shut it down. So Christmas for us uh, is, is, is a very strong holiday in Europe and uh, in, the, in North America and some, in some parts of, uh, of Latin America as well, uh, especially those are, uh, that are in the Catholic uh, uh, era, Catholic faith um, regions. Uh, they'll celebrate Christmas a lot. Um, and of course, with Christians as a whole, Christmas is celebrated. But think about this. It is Christ Mass. So that just by itself lets you know that this has a Catholic element to it. That by itself has a Catholic element. So then you trace it back. And where does it go? It goes all the way back to Nimrod. It goes back to pagan uh, practices. Now, uh, are we saying that we should not celebrate Christmas? I'm saying that we should understand what it is. That's what I'm saying today. I'm not saying that uh, it, things are not in our recent memory. We don't bow down and worship to trees and you know we don't have sacrifices and we don't uh, practice the same things that, uh, that all of their 
you know, tr- pagan trees and all of that stuff that the uh, prophets were talking about. But we have to recognize that that there is a pagan root to uh, this time of year. And this holiday was not celebrated by the early church. The birth of Jesus Christ was in the record. It was historically documented. Uh, it was used to verify who Jesus was. The son of Matt that, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of, which was the son of, which was the son of 14 generations and 14 generations and 14 generations. When you read Matthew, when you read Luke, they're tracing the genes, uh, the, the genetics of going into bringing about this uh, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in flesh or Yeshua HaMashiach, um, uh, to say it in Hebrew, Jesus the Messiah. So when we, uh, when we look at that, they are using this for historical purposes to verify and to tell the story of how it came to pass as a witness and as a testimony. He's Emmanuel. Uh, Gabriel came. This is what happened with Joseph. This is what happened with Mary. This is what happened with her cousin Elizabeth. This is what happened, you know, when the wise men came. Uh, but there's so many myths that are here uh, that just kind of all get blended into one thing. And you say, how did this happen? For 300 years, the church did not celebrate it. It was not until Constantine that these uh, feasts uh, were were brought together um, or celebrations were brought together uh, from uh, bringing in uh, Tammuz and Nimrod and Ceramus and pagan practices and just adopting them and changing the names over. And now suddenly you have a trinity, you know, of, of father and son and woman. So this the same picture of Nimrod and Ceramus and Tammuz. Uh, you even have Tammuz. You even have Tammuz uh, written about in the prophets, and the Queen of Heaven is mentioned there, talking about Ceramus. So Nimrod, the Nimrodic Empire, which we talked about this on Tuesday about Babylon, the rise of Babylon, the pagan world that knows these things loves this time of year because this is when Nimrod's birthday and Tammuz's birthday and all of this is going on. This is all being celebrated December 23rd and December 25th. It's also at the equinox and the very uh, superstitious people were afraid that the winter was going to be so bad they would not survive it. They would use the evergreen as a symbol that we will not die. It stays green even in the winter, etc., etc. And so this is how these symbols somewhere get modernized and still put into our homes. Years ago, people used to preach against Christmas trees just because they knew that there was a pagan root to them. Now, our memories do not have any of this pagan. We don't see pagans around us. We don't see people talking about Nimrod. There's no uh, Tammuz worship, etc. And so that was 300, uh, 325, okay, uh, 380, whatever, AD. We are 21st century now, and we can tell the difference. We know the difference. But I want you to understand that there are spirits and that there are things around these traditions because they're not connected to the actual birth of Christ. There is, there is a way to calculate when Jesus was born based upon the fact that John the Baptist was conceived six months before him. And so you have to then go to the priestly line of Zacharias, and through the calculations of the priestly line, you can tell the exact month that Zacharias was in the temple when when Gabriel stood by the side of the altar and told him that he was going to have a son. He went mute because he doubted. And then, of course, his name is John. Six months later, Mary has the same visitation from Gabriel. And so you can track it from when they were uh, there in the in the temple doing the temple order uh, in the course of the priesthood, and then you just add six months on, and there you have uh, the time when Jesus was conceived, and then you move that forward nine months, and you get approximately when Jesus was born. So we know that the, the shepherds were watching their flocks by night, so this has to the, then be a certain season when this was happening, because the shepherds didn't always do that. So there are some that say it's April, an April 1st date, 
And there are others that say it's an October 1st date. I've also heard a June 1st date. So they're saying now the, that there, it, it's between April and October. Uh, that's the best guess. That's still a six months uh, kind of variance, but it wasn't, the point is, it wasn't for sure in December. So how did it become that? They just wanted to bring the pagan, uh, the pagan people around. They had to throw them a bone. It was a part of uh, trying to assimilate Christianity into pagan uh, practices and everyone working with Constantine, who's now the first officially Christian em uh, emperor. He's using it to his advantage. It's a political maneuver. And so he just says, we'll just switch it out. You all will know what it is. You pagans can still celebrate your holiday. We'll just call it Christ. Uh, we'll call it the birth of Jesus and we'll, everyone will be happy. And so they mixed tradition and they mixed paganism and they mixed faith and they tried to put all that together for an advantage. So uh, these are just, to those that have done any research, this is not new, but the point that I'm saying today <clears throat> is, that, is that there are certain times of, uh, of, of the year when we might feel actually more uh, spiritual activity, but because we are dealing with so many other layers of things, of busyness, parties, uh, meals, you know, exchanging gifts, get-togethers, lots of wonderful family memories are there. And of course, because people are talking about Jesus, the churches are trying to take advantage of it as best that they can and having chorales sing and uh, having you know, little uh, live nativities and uh, Christmas story and trying to do whatever they can to get people to come out to hear uh, the living Christmas tree and whatever that they do. Uh, and so there, there are a lot of religious activities and there are many times God breaking through all of those layers of tradition because we're preaching him and we're opening up the word of God. The word of God will work wherever we work it. But we have to also understand the context. Brother Stone King used to tell me, I don't travel in December. He said, because in December, there's a big, fat, um, a red, <laughs> red suited wearing man that comes into all the churches and there's no revival in December. Spirit of Christmas comes to church and there's no revival. So he said, so I just stay home until the new year. He used to do a New Year's Eve revival for years and years, here, right here in Houston. For 20 plus years, he did a New Year's Eve revival that would go one, two weeks into the new year, and it would be a phenomenal way to kick off the year. Uh, but December uh, December uh, was something that he would not do. He would not do just because of that one thing. I remember when I traveled, I would preach right up till Christmas. And uh, I remember one year I was so... Uh, angry of, at the spirit world, just the, the frustration that I felt of trying to get anything done or really move things or having uh, prayer, uh, prayers answered. It seemed like people were so distracted and they're asking me to have revival. One year, I, and this went over really great, I, I preached a message called Christmas in Hell. And <laughs> of course, they didn't invite me back after that. But I was talking about how we can be buying and selling and planting and building and marrying and giving in marriage, and we can miss everything that God is doing. What if Jesus comes right in the middle of Christmas time? Would we even be ready? We're so distracted. So that was my point. It didn't go over well because I was supposed to uh, stay with the narrative, you know, of God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Um, this year, I am... I have just noticed that the Holy Spirit has been talking to me a lot about family and family revival, and we've just stayed on that theme. I haven't even mentioned uh, Emmanuel yet. That's pro I probably will before it's all over because I love to talk about the revelation of who Jesus is. I love to talk about the first advent. I love to share that, that the word became flesh. I love to talk about, uh, about that because it's so powerful. But what has been in my spirit this morning is that is that this is actually feeding, these, these things are feeding um, a, a very powerful network of paganism around the world that's rising. There is, a, there is a lot of demonic celebrating that we don't know about. There's a lot of things in high places uh, where, where they are going back, this Nimrodic, this Nimrodic empire, this Babylonian empire, this is their favorite time of year. 
This is when they do a lot of their practices. Between Halloween and, and Christmas, this is when the pagans, when the witches are very, very active. And it's at strategic times on our calendar. We're just coming out of Yom Kippur. We're just coming out uh, of the spiritual new year, 5782. And then we run right into this, uh, it's this Halloween, which is Hallow's Eve, another Catholic holiday for All Saints Day, contacting the dead, the veil of the spirit world being thin, uh, all of this infusion of demonic all around us. And then that is usually right during the time of election in our election cycles. You're electing someone in November. So right before you have your elections, all these pagan practices are going on. They're releasing demonic spirits, trying to sway people. So we have to fight against all of that while we are, uh, at least in the American uh, cycles of, of elections. Elections happen all different times in different countries. Uh, but we have that battle. We have that battle. Now we're going into the new year. We're just about to go into a new Gregorian year. And this is when we're trying to really hear from God. We're trying to get our directives. We're getting our marching orders. We're trying to, we're trying to have all these wonderful uh, uh, insights into what God wants to do as we change over in the Gregorian calendar. And what do you have? All of this infusion of stimuli for the flesh. Again, I'm not making people happy today. But I mean all the sugar and all of the desire for things and all the focus on the superficial can easily, listen to me, can easily override the greater, deeper revelations that, are, that we love to focus on at this time of year. So I have done multiple extended fasts in December. I've done multiple extended fasts because I wanted to counteract all of this. And I've actually heard many awesome things from God in the month of December, because it seems that um, the, the, the pipelines are a little more open for me. It's not very congested. Fasting in December, I'm not, uh, I, there's not a lot of other people that are fasting in December. And I seem to uh, be able to get further along in the spirit sometimes when I'm doing things that are against the grain uh, and I'm able to separate, I'm able to understand. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, that I don't celebrate it, but I understand what it is and what it's not. We as a family, as a Cisco family, have always had incredible prayer times during Christmas. That's what Christmas is for us, is that we have one day dedicated for praying for every member of our growing family, every grandkid, every, every adult, every spouse. And we have had prophetic words. We have had healings. Um, we have had three or four hour prayer meetings. Um, it, it has been something that we look forward to. The gifts are a sidebar. It's fun. It's great to give to each other and to receive things. It's fun. Uh, but what we're really there for is when we're together, it's a time to be with Bishop Cisco, the patriarch of our family. And he prays for the grandkids. We pray alongside of him. Um, and I would fast and pray for coming in because I knew it was going to be, it could be life altering for my kids. God could step into this situation. It is what you make it. It can be something absolutely awesome because we focus on who Jesus is. We're setting time apart. But it's very easily something that could carry us away in so much that the carnal man is so focused upon that by the time we're trying to get around to the new year and start fasting in the new year and praying in the new year, man, we are sluggish, we are, we're resistant, and we don't want to do anything, and this is not a good way to start the new year. So it's after all of this indulgence that we have New Year's resolutions, and of course, what they don't last, do they? Because we should have lifestyle. Now, what I've learned from those that are uh, pros in working out and health and all this stuff, it doesn't matter what time of year it is, they're staying to their diet. We have a man in our church that exercises, a brand new convert, exercises about six hours a day. He's a serious, uh, seriously dedicated um, athlete. I mean, he would not even eat uh, the simple, you know, uh, croissant breakfast sandwiches that we offered at our join the family reception because he didn't want the bread. He says, no, I've already had egg whites and broccoli this morning. 
So I was like, wow, okay, it doesn't matter what time of year it is. He's going to eat the same diet because he wants to stay on track. And for us as people of God, we have to stay on track. We have to keep the same vigilance. We have to keep the same focus. We have to keep the, the, um, the same disciplines in place for our prayer life. Uh, if they'll do that for their physical body, how much more should we do that for our spiritual lives? So I want us to start today, and I've already had a 30-minute open, but I want us to just open up our hearts right now. And I want us to ask God again to just help us to disconnect for a little bit. If we can, for this last 30 minutes, just disconnect from everything else around us right now. And to say, God, give us understanding. Give us an infusion. We're stopping everything to just be filled with the glory of who you are. And we can say, God, let this season be flipped. Let it be something that we can take ground and not lose ground. That we can advance the kingdom. That we can see the potential. And we can understand the dangers. Let's pray together. Father, we just come to you today in the name of Jesus. And we just ask you, Father, that you would open up our hearts today, that you would open up our minds today, that you would get in to the deep fabric of our lifestyle and the minutia of why we do what we do in the, in the areas of desire and motive and focus, oh God. I pray that there be no time of year that we will not have a move of the Holy Spirit. I pray that there'll be no Sunday of the year where your Holy Spirit is, is grieved or your Holy Spirit is violated or your Holy Spirit is, is, is quenched. You said quench not the Holy Spirit. But we wanna give you glory today. We wanna give you honor today. We want to acknowledge who you are. We celebrate your scriptures. We celebrate your word and we thank you for it, but we pray that we would be alert and that we would be aware and that we would understand what is happening in the spirit world in spite of all of the festivities and busyness. God, let it be meaningful. Let us have meaningful connections with our family, meaningful connections with our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we would have meaningful understanding uh, and, and, and breakthroughs, oh God, in our relationship with you, Oh God, that you would speak to us, disconnect us, oh God, from this hurry, scurry and hustle and bustle. Disconnect us, oh God, from this age, oh God, of consumerism and, and, and fleshly uh, indulgences and help us, oh God, to know how to celebrate, know how to abound, to know how to be blessed, to know how to have favor, to know when, oh God, we can sit around the table and enjoy a good meal or have a great piece of pie, but also understand, oh God, that our disciplines never change, that our lifestyle never changes, that our prayer life never changes, that listening to God never changes, that you still have things to say, oh God, to us, despite what our calendar is, and that anything that is in, uh, ahead of you is an idol. Anything that is more important than you is idolatry. Anything that stands in the way of our relationship with you is a sin. And so we come to you today and we ask you, Lord, to forgive us, to wash us, to cleanse us, to purify us. Oh God, today help us to recognize and see clearly what is going on we are fighting the spirit of Babylon. We are fighting the spirit of Antichrist in this month of December. We are fighting it. We are standing against it in the name of Jesus, this paganism that is manifest in the world. Help us to hate what is evil. Help us to hate what is evil. And help us, oh God, to please you with our lives. That you hate leasing the word leasing is, is, is paganism or idolatry. You hate it. Oh God, and I pray, Lord Jesus, today that you would cause us, Lord, to have the true revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to know you, Jesus. Put your hand on me right now, Lord. I want to be zealous for the things of God. I want to love the Lord my God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, and with all of my strength. 
a su le echu y que a lo cana es satón de la que ama. A su lo lopo la bella se lo rica la basa. A su rabor de que a robo choco. I want you to just pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Ma yara te koya alama sata la rakagi. A su likaya aratasa in Jesus name. In Jesus' name, Makali, Aromolo, Sulapacha, Laka. We take our loins, good about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet shot, with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We stand in the name of Jesus. We stand, O oh God, and we are awake. We are not asleep, Father. We are still awake. We're still hearing you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for your word today. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us today. I thank you for your blessings today. I thank you for your promises today. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. There are, there are some of our apostolic brethren uh, that do not celebrate Christmas at all. Uh, of course, Muslims do not. Um... And then there are some that celebrate, uh, you know, uh, January 6th is different from January 25th. And there's a lot of customs around that as well. There's a lot of myths around the wise men. There's a lot of myths about when they showed up and where they showed up. Um, 12 days apparently after, but that's, um, that is tradition. But I think that oftentimes... The Holy Spirit is wanting to work and he's wanting to teach us. And we can be ignorant of a lot of things. We can be ignorant of a lot of things. But the Holy Spirit can, the, the Holy Spirit can still guide our life the things that we don't know. We pray in the spirit because we don't know what we should pray for. So the spirit prays for us. So that same principle can be used uh, around traditions until we know what it actually is. There are a lot of traditions in our normal, what we would call our normal church service. There's a lot of traditions. Uh, in our buildings, there's traditions. Steeples, what, are, what do they represent? Why do we have them? Uh, what's with the stained glass windows? Why are there stained glass windows? Uh, I mean, you could just go on and on. Why are the altars the way they are? Uh, why do we have, you know, uh, pews? Or why do we have church at 10 o'clock? Or why was there Sunday night services? Or, you know, all of these things, where did it come from? Um, uh, so you, you, ask, you can ask a lot of those questions, but here's the thing that humbles me is that I didn't know any of this, but I still got the Holy Ghost. I didn't know any of this, but I still heard God's voice. I didn't know any of this and miracles still happened. People are arguing over whether we should say Jesus or Yeshua. Um, I, I use the point, I pray in the name of Jesus and the demons go out, so God honors it. Is it Greek? Yes. Was the New Testament written in Greek? Apparently at some point. It was probably Hebrew to Aramaic and Aramaic to Greek. Based on, on the research that I've seen uh, recently, some books may have been written directly into Greek. So it's Aesos in Greek, which translates into Jesus for us. Uh, some, some say it, it kind of looks, sounds a little bit more like Zeus. And so it could be pagan to say Jesus. It's a, it is a transliteration. And so, 
in the transliteration of, of Scripture. It's whatever it sounds like in your language. But it's the revelation knowledge of who Jesus is. That's what it is. It's the revelation knowledge of who Jesus is. And the fact that the spirit world backs it up. When I was in Ethiopia, I heard it. It's Jesus in Ethiopia. It's Jesus in Spanish. You can say Jesus if you're in French. You can say Jesus if it's English. You can say Yeshua if it's in Hebrew. But guess what? In the spirit world, when you pray, the demons will go out no matter how your language pronounces it. It's the revelation of who he is that makes it valid and important. But the thing that's amazing to me is that even though I don't know a whole lot, the spirit fills in the gaps. I didn't use the Jewish calendar for the longest time. The Hebrew calendar didn't use it. But the spirit would teach me. I would understand that in October, something would change. I didn't know why something changes in October. And I realize now it's because the calendar, God's calendar changes around Yom Kippur every year. Now I'm much more attuned. God had to teach that to me, had to show me that. But the spirit was doing that with me for years. And I didn't know anything about the Jewish calendar. I, I wasn't raised a Jew. I didn't grow up speaking Hebrew. I didn't practice any of the, those things. I was taught that all that was done away with. So we didn't, we don't have any dietary laws. We don't keep the Sabbath. We don't, the Sabbath is through the Holy Spirit. They say that's, that's what the Sabbath is now. It's the rest of God. So we have, um, we have services on Sunday, not on Sabbath. Jesus arose from the dead on Sunday. It became moved to Sunday. That's when they celebrated his resurrection. We even see this with uh, Acts, um, was it Acts, or 1 Corinthians, was it 16? Uh, first day of the week, lay aside a, a, an offering for the Lord on the first day of the week. So uh, apparently there was something going on on the first day of the week, even though many of them still kept the Sabbath. Um, some are going back to keeping the Sabbath. Whole movement, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, they do that, going back to trying to keep the Sabbath again. All of this stuff, folks, it can be a minutia, it can be a distraction. The Holy Spirit helps us to make progress in the world through his grace and through his truth. So the thing that we want to know is, are we getting results? When I pray, Am I getting results? When I pray, am I hearing God? When I pray, am I growing? When we are gathered together, are lives being changed? So Paul talks about some people acknowledge a day and it's as unto the Lord. Some people don't acknowledge a day and they do that as unto the Lord. In other words, what they're saying is every day is special now that we know who Jesus is. And so we don't wait one, one day more special than another. Others say, no, these are special days. And it's because I know who Jesus is. I know, understand what these days mean. And I do that as unto the Lord. The point is, is that we do not get caught up in the tradition or we do not get caught up in the minutia or we do not get distracted by other things, but we keep the main thing, the main thing, and we have results. So my encouragement to all of us today, Church Triumphant family, we have our, our family customs. Not all traditions are bad. There are good traditions and there are bad traditions. We have to have a test of what a bad tradition is. We have to know what a bad tradition is. And so how do I know something is a bad tradition? If it keeps me from the revelation of Jesus Christ, it is a bad tradition. If it holds back the spirit in any way, it is a bad tradition. If it uh, distracts me from obedience to God, it is a bad tradition. If it feeds my carnal man only, it is a bad tradition. Many of the feast days, they said, eat the fat, eat the sweet, enjoy, celebrate, have a good time. Didn't mean you couldn't have a nice meal or even eat something sweet. But there were also fasting seasons and fasting lifestyles that were a part of their faith. So uh, eating together and fellowshipping together, 
these things not in, are inherently not bad. Eating and drinking is not inherently bad. Buying and selling is not inherently bad. Uh, marrying and giving in marriage is not inherently bad. But Sodom missed the angels, missed their moment of deliverance because the buying and selling and eating and drinking and planting and building and, uh, and all of the and marrying and giving in marriage, they missed it because it numbed them to spiritual things and they couldn't recognize the angels as angels when they came in uh, to their culture because they had everything else was filled with the busyness of the temporal and the physical. So it was the seduction of the secondary. And so what all I'm doing today and what we are doing in, in, in prayer today is we are just recalibrating ourselves and making sure that we do not become dull of hearing in this season or that we are not so distracted that we miss God because we have to be prepared for this new year. We have to get ready for 2022. We have to get ready for 2023. We have to understand what God has already put in motion on his calendar in 5782. And that, and that God, God's spirit doesn't stop moving just like, and this is the point that I've been trying to make about paganism, is that Satan doesn't stop trying to make advances uh, just because it's his particular day of the year. Matter of fact, he's going to try to use this as much as possible to make advances. He's going to use whatever holiday he can to, to, for his agenda as well. And so we have to recognize that just because we might be taking the day off, hell is not. That just because we're not interested in prayer because we've got so many festivities going on doesn't mean that hell has stopped its bombardment. More suicides happen in December because people are lonely. They're missing their family members. They're grieving people that have walked out of their lives. They've gone through divorces. They're single parents. They don't have any money. They're a comparison of other people. Well, they have more than I do. Okay, depression, drunkenness, uh, suicide, aloneness, all these things are going on during this time of year. Uh, uh, so we have to recognize Satan is going to try to exploit his advantage, whatever he can get. So as intercessors and as spiritual, uh, spiritual warfare uh, participants, as watchmen on the wall, we don't stop watching just because, you know, the music is playing. It's the most wonderful time of the year. My eyes are closed and I don't want to hear from God right now. Okay. <laughs> and I don't want to spoil your fun today. But what my point is, is that the Holy Spirit is going to always bring a correction to our flesh. Flesh is flesh is flesh is flesh is flesh. And I die daily, even on Christmas. I die daily, even on Christmas. I thought I was talking to elite soldiers here today. I thought I was talking to elite intercessors today. So I'm actually probably being easy on you. If I was talking to elite soldiers, I would not have to press, I would not have to preface any of this. You would go, I understand. It would be an immediate click. Yep, I'm feeling the same thing. So I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to um, condemn you either or try to make you feel less. But what I'm saying is, is that the more attuned you are to the spirit, the more you walk in that passion to stay focused. And when something is trying to pull you off of it, it becomes something that you have to just manage. And you have to be able to separate. Like they talk about, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You, um, you don't throw the chicken out with the bones, okay? But you do have to discern. You cannot turn your discernment off. You cannot turn your insight off. You have to be aware that there is a lot of things. God was opening my mind again. He was showing me again today. If you want to know what God was showing me today, what God was showing me was the global elites and what they're doing at this time of year. That's what God was showing me today. He was showing me this Nimrodic empire celebration. This is when they have the birthday of their whole secret society, of all the Luciferian thinking, of all of the practices that, that have given them the power that they have. This is the time of year 
when on the highest levels, they are, they are, uh, they are celebrating in the whole Illuminati uh, realm of the world. And so I am praying about how I am supposed to counteract that, what I'm supposed to do about that. And this is my uh, attempt today in talking to you. So we must be intentional. And I'm going to close the broadcast with this today. We must be intentional about letting Jesus know he's number one. Number two, we have to be intentional about focusing on the revelation of Jesus Christ and who he is. Number three, we have to be intentional about our worship. If you really want to make this about, about the wise men, okay, let's talk about that. They were the most educated men in the world. They were called kingmakers. The Magi were called kingmakers. If the Magi got behind you, you could topple an entire administration. The Magi determined who the next leader of Babylon would be. The Magi were led by Daniel. Daniel took them over in Babylon. We must be wiser than the wise men of this world. We must be more prophetic than the astrologers. We must be more consecrated than all the diviners, than all the witches. We must be able to be, to be closer to God than they are to their sources of the demonic that give them their information. We must know numbers and calendars and the seasons and all of the, of the heavenly bodies that God has set there. He said he put the stars, the sun, moon, and the stars. He put the, he, when he made the sun and the moon and the stars, he said they were for times and for dates, for times and for seasons and for days and years. It was Issachar that was able to understand the times. They were able to understand the cycles that were in the heavens and how it related to their calendar and when they were supposed to celebrate what they celebrated. Issachar was a key player in the prophetic and in the practice of their faith. Daniel was able to give us his 70 weeks, the empires, the order. He was able to interpret dreams. He became the head of the Magi. Why were they looking for Jesus? At the time they were looking for him, they saw a star. Who taught them all that? Daniel taught them that. And when they came, what did they come to do? They came to worship. And by the way, just because there were three gifts doesn't mean there was only three magi. It didn't say there were three magi. Most likely, historically speaking, there was probably a thousand or more in their caravan. It made Herod tremble before them because they were looking for a king that was not in his lineage. He was afraid. That's why he killed all the babies because the magi, which were the kingmakers, these were the most intelligent they were the most prophetic. They were the most scientifically astute. They were the most well-traveled. They were the most powerful people in the world. And you know what they did? You would be called the 0.1 percenters of the world. They were, they were wealthy beyond, beyond any, of any other uh, people. They were the wealthiest people in the world. And you know what they did? They worshiped. They worshiped with exceeding great joy. So if you want to be the best of the best, the elite of the elite, then you will take this time of year to be an extravagant giver and an extravagant worshiper because that's what they did. They rejoiced publicly and openly with exceeding great joy. They said, we've come to worship. So we must be intentional about our worship. Now, if you want to close it out with a fifth point, we would say we will be vigilant in our warfare. But God, whatever you require of me, I will do. Whatever kind of praying that you need me to pray, I will pray. Whatever I need to guard against or focus against, it doesn't mean that I take over the, the, um, you know, the Christmas meal and go, do you know this is pagan? <laughs> because it may not be what we're doing is pagan. What we're doing is taking an opportunity that the world has set aside to acknowledge the birth of Christ. We know he wasn't born on December 25th. But for us, 
If we're using it for that, then we can sanctify that day as unto the Lord and we can use it for God's purposes. But we are vigilant in saying, God, we are going to push back the spirit world as it pertains to this time of year. We are gonna be vigilant. If others are not, we will be. And we will be prepared. We will be hearing God. We'll be close to him. And he will, he will acknowledge that and there will be opportunities. I've had some of the best prayers in December. I've had some of the closest intimate experiences with God because I, I was discerning because he helped me somehow by his grace to be discerning. Amen. So this is my prayer for you. Father, we come to you today right now. And I ask you, Lord, that you would help us to be intentional as the body of Christ. Help us as your people. Oh God, while we are acknowledging teachers and being thankful for them, while we are uh, acknowledging our family members and giving gifts to them as we're acknowledging coworkers or friends, giving gifts to them, significant people in our life. We're being thankful for them. End of the year, it's a perfect time to do that. And while we are eating and while we are going through all of our calendars and all of the events that we have, we want you to be first. We want to be intentional, oh God, in our, in our study and our research and our love of your word. And we want to focus in on what you really did, on who you are and what it means to the world. Peace on earth, the angels. This is a time when we acknowledge angels. So Lord, let it not just be a Christmas card or a poster or a sign or something trite of a little picture of, a, of an angel with a halo. But Lord, let, it, let us understand that when you came, Lord, and this is the time we focus on it, whether you were born at this time or not, this is when we study these verses. I pray that you would use that for your glory and that we would get closer to the angelic, that we would get closer, oh God, to the supernatural. There is so much supernatural around this time, this story that we celebrate this time of year. So I pray that the supernatural power of God would be evident around us, that we would be vigilant in our prayers, that we would be consistent in our lifestyle, that we would listen to you, that we would hear you. That we would pray the prayers that you want us to pray and you would help us to have meaningful relationships, meaningful times of connecting and that your kingdom can advance. Father, you give us discernment by your Holy Spirit that we would be aware of you, we would be conscious of you that we would not drift during this time of year, but we would be directed. I thank you for your love, Jesus. I thank you for your love, Jesus. I thank you for your love, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Have your way in our lives, Lord. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name. Well, I hope I've been an encouragement to you today. Thank you for coming and being a part of this broadcast. We love you. We're so appreciative of you. Thank you for all of your kindness to me. Thank you for all of your kind words. I appreciate it. Pray for me that I would just continue to walk in obedience before the Lord. That's my one prayer. I ask you to pray that God will help me to be so focused on obeying him that nothing and no one will, 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 will stop that um, that request from being answered in my life. Above everything, I must please the Lord. And above everything, you must please the Lord. We, as the body of Christ right now, must obey the Holy Spirit. So this is our prayer today. Everything that we need is already here. Everything that we need is already in the kingdom Everything that we need comes from him. And so I am so content in his presence and I'm so grateful and I'm humbled and I am, I am tender in his presence today because he has been so good to me. God bless you. We love you. 
And remember, don't stay in the shadows when you can dwell in the light because every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Per, per nation, we love you. This has been High Noon.